Hello, welcome to today's podcast. Today, I'm going to be playing for you an interview that I did with F-Stoppers Magazine and Jonathan Lee Martin. Uh, here it is. Um, you've been at this for how long? Um, that is, you know, traveling for wedding photography, I, I know is, is really in your, your niche, but then I see all the great travel content. So what's the what's back on that? Yeah, so I'm a little bit, I would say, schizophrenic when it comes to my online branding, um, that I like to... I like weddings and I also like travel and I know the the mentality is like you have to niche down and like pick one to be successful in it but I find that they both kind of work together um, and not only that they also work together in a way that it creates a lot of good opportunities that my couples that like to travel will now bring me for their engagement sessions or um, if they're getting married somewhere else they have like this immediate trust with me um, so by like dual specializing I feel like it actually kind of put my career where I wanted it to go rather than just like listening to what um, everyone kind of told me and what makes, I guess, the most sense as far as like common sense goes. Um, my background, so originally, even before I found photography, um, I was in like the snowboard and skateboard scene for a long time. And pretty much all I wanted to do was create like awesome photos of my friends doing stuff um, for no real purpose, not to get in a magazine or anything at that point, but just like I wanted to just take cool content of them. Um, that they would be appreciative of, that they could look back on in like 10 years. Um, and then I was doing a lot of snowboard. I'm up here like an hour west of Toronto, so um, winter gets cold, there's lots of snow. And I was pretty much just playing around with this like Olympus two megapixel point and shoot. And I got some good photos like from just like those like bluebird days, like it's really, the days that were really easy to shoot were possible to shoot really effectively on it. Um, and then it also had like this video mode where um, you could set it to like 360p or whatever, um, like minimal video quality is. And I was like, okay, like I'm going to this trip. I'm going to the West Coast of Canada, going to Whistler, going to record this video. Um, and just like, instead of doing photography on this trip, I want to make a travel film. And I just kind of went out and did it. It was not good. Um, I don't even know if it exists anymore, which is another sad thing that um, whenever you like host something on a platform, make sure you like keep a backup, like back all your stuff up because you don't know what's going to be important 10 years from now because I, like, I'd be so stoked to see that video again. Um, but unfortunately, it has since uh, disappeared. But yeah, just by like creating that video, I realized that I wanted to, that this was an avenue that I wanted to explore. Um, and then... A lot of my friends were in bands, so I started uh, music photography, do their promos, do concert shots, um, make them look cool. Those actually ended up in a lot of magazines. Um, and that's where I got kind of my internal motivation from was like that I had no interest in being in front of the camera. All I wanted to do was just like, I don't know, create stuff to make my friends look awesome. Um, and then they started inviting me more places. I was like very introverted, very, it was very challenging for me to just like, mesh into a social scene so my kind of value I guess like proposition to the scene and to getting invited places was to create good content and kind of document um, which is why how I kind of found my stride in that um, then those guys started getting married and started doing some uh, photos like of them and it was awesome because um, I've I've talked about it a little bit online but like the first few weddings that I got I booked some free ones off Craigslist and they were very very challenging um, and I was like, there's no way I'm ever going to do wedding photography, even though there is um, money to be made in it and like an actual sustainable career, which is pretty rare in photography. Um, and then a few of my, the guys that I knew from bands started getting married and they were like, yeah, just come shoot our wedding, but like, don't be a wedding photographer. Just shoot it like you would shoot a concert. Like if stuff's happening, take pictures. Like we don't want the forced pose, like just annoying stuff that most other wedding photographers are going to do. Um, so I went out and that was awesome. Like that was the greatest form of photography, like that I just got to shoot a, essentially a band, like essentially a concert, but instead of being in this like crappy, dingy, um, like basement nightclub that I got to be in this like beautiful, well-lit scene where they put money into actually making it look good. Um, and after that, that was like, okay, like I'm pretty sold on this, but how do I actually find those clients? Um, and then once I found a bunch of those clients, uh, that I guess like, again, it was kind of the dual branding thing where instead of specializing in weddings, like I still had concert photography on my website, um, which is very much like a no, no, I think in the grand scheme of like everyone, every other wedding photography instructor, it's like, you're going to run like weddings and also like band photos. Like you're going to, you're not going to be successful at either. 
And it worked at a like it got those people to attach to me and be like, oh, like we want to hire Taylor because he's not a wedding photographer. He's a music photographer that also shoots weddings. Um, and then from there, it was like, I've always had an interest in travel um, to bring it like way back. That's like how I got into it was making that first travel film. Um, and I'd always wanted to do that. Going, going to places and, and taking pictures like has always been great. Um, I for sure enjoy the process of it, but it's like, I don't think you convey quite the feeling you do whenever you go and you do um, either like kind of hybrid, both fusion of stills and photos, or if you just go and you just do um, just like just video only. Um, I feel like that's how you kind of capture a place. And I feel like that's the direction, at least in my eyes, that the photography industry is moving. And I've noticed it with like with my wedding couples that they're always hiring me for the most part now for photo and video coverage. And as well as like my commercial clients, when I can just drop in and be like one human or one human with an assistant or um, somebody to come help out and I can do photography and I can also do like a little promo video or an Instagram video for them. Um, that's like, I don't know, it's like, it's a huge value proposition for them. So I only foresee my shift going even more for video um, kind of over the next little bit. That's an interesting point. Like, um, how do you balance uh, going between video and photo? Like whether at a wedding or even we travel, but, uh, me personally, I've always found that they tend to compete. You always agonize over, should I be shooting video or should I just go all in talk to So how do you deal with that balance? It's, um, it's a struggle. So I, th I think traveling, um, there's more of like, you have a little bit more time to do what you want to do. Um, so to create the balance in there, I think is easier. And also it's um, the other thing, which is kind of humorous, I guess, to, is just to remember to actually do video. That if you're a photographer and you're like hardwired to be a photographer, um, you're gonna go like a half a day and be like, oh crap, like I haven't shot any video content today and I'm trying to make this video. Um, for weddings, it's a lot more fast paced. So it's like, you have to figure out like if, if they're about to do their first kiss, like you're taking pictures of it. And then as soon as they like put their hands up and cheer, you're already in video mode recording that moment. Um, and it's all just kind of deciding which moments play the best in video. And that just comes with like a couple years of experience of being like, okay, every highlight film, I seem to use kind of this style of thing. Um, and usually it's the most candid um, of the wedding day. So um, very like the highlight films that I create are usually just like entirely candid. And sometimes they don't even have the first kiss in them and they don't have like those key elements that you would suspect. But I think that together they still tell like an amazing story of the day. So um, yeah, it's just all about figuring out what plays best and what you use and then kind of rehashing that over and over again until you get kind of the best possible outcome. So from a two megapixel Olympus <laughs> to uh, doing all the things at the wedding. So how long would you say that that journey took you? It was, so I've been a wedding photographer um, probably almost like 15 years now. I shot my first wedding about 15 years ago. And in that process, I'm gonna say it was like 2009, 2010. Um, when the Nikon D90 came out was originally, I think, when I started trying to do um, at least elements of video. And at that point, it was like the, it wasn't hybrid coverage, it was called fusion coverage, which was like the weirdest slideshow where it goes from like video clips to photos and back to videos. And it's like, I would say it didn't excite me at all, but I wanted to either make a photo or I wanted to make a proper like highlight video. And it took the technology a while to catch up. Like the, the main thing, is essentially like how fast you can switch between photo and video mode. And it took a long time for like card speeds and buffers and everything to come together so that I could switch. Um, it's still like a second delay, but it's way better than it was. Um, even with like the Nikon D750, um, that's like the camera that I told like, if you wanted to go out and do the style of coverage, like get a Nikon D750. Uh, but now after like shooting the 850 and the D5 for a couple years, it's kind of like, wow, that camera is so slow in comparison to right now. So I'm excited to see what the next, um, I don't know what's next in the world, but I'm always testing out like every single camera. I'm the, I think the only person in the world that like gets a camera in my hand and just like shoots like 25 raw photos and then tries to switch to video mode as fast as possible. Um, and I, I try to bring that information to people because I feel like that's, that's a thing, but no, that's like not a benchmark anywhere. That's not a thing that anyone cares about um, in product reviews. So. I'm, I'm doing my part, I guess, to, to hopefully show companies that there is a need for it. And the Nikon D850 fills that need. And I would love to shoot Sony, but um, the buffer seems to be like capped within 
the body. So regardless of how fast the cards you put in it, it's still like a crazy slow write time. So while their video quality is amazing, um, it's just like not even usable for me because of like the five, like eight second delay in between shooting photos and switching to video. So. Oh man, yeah. I'm a Magic Lantern guy here. So I, I did the grand. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, I don't know if you remember the off brands, but Computer Bay, that company that made those off brand compact flash cards. It was basically yeah, yeah. based on um, Lexar's memory. Well, they were based like half an hour from where I live in Georgia. And so I went there hunting for some El Chico cards when I started shooting Magic Lantern. Yeah. Trying, to, trying to echo a little bit more speed out of uh, like 5D Mark III, which is uh, still going strong, but no more Magic Lantern. Yeah. Uh, no more of those days. No, it's, yeah, it's been interesting that like that's, that used to be the thing. Like every single person that I knew shot it. And now, um, I didn't even just didn't even think about it until now, but I feel like I haven't seen anybody with that running in like a little while. So, so only fifteen years. Um, so specifically, when you started doing some travel stuff, um, would you say that there was a particular year where you kind of you kind of realized that you were transitioning to doing more travel and um, consider different uh, a different lifestyle to facilitate that? Was there a moment like that or a year like that? It, it would have been, um, so I, I run a show called A Photographer In, and it would have been like season one of that show that I realized that I had a pretty cool calendar of commercial work coming up. And what I wanted to do was when I was out shooting um, that job in like the UK or wherever, that I would also record a piece of content that was what I wanted to be creating. Um, I think it kind of always goes back to creating the portfolio that you want to be doing. Cause like nobody's just going to drop, like be like, hey, you seem like you have a mediocre introverted personality you should have a travel show um nobody's ever going to like just sign you up for that or a magazine at least in my experience they're not just going to cold call you and be like hey can you run like go to wherever patagonia and do this photo series for us um unless you have a good kind of reputation that's already in the the vein of what they want you to be creating um so i figured i would just go out just start creating the portfolio that i eventually wanted to get paid to go and shoot um, so I saw that I had enough, um, kind of spots that I felt made like kind of a season of a show. So I went out and just kind of started figuring it out and season one's all handheld, just like selfie cam. Uh, and it was fun. It was fun figuring out one, how to go to a place and tell a story as, as like somebody trying to convey this information and this feeling, I guess, that you get from the place, um, to the internet and to the viewer. And then also like creating cool photos and kind of telling a cool story along the way that somebody can actually watch and it's entertaining, but you also get photography education out of it as well. Um, which I think is like the way that the entire industry has slowly started to shift as well. That if you, if you can make a funny, engaging, um, YouTube video that actually teaches you something or, um, that you learn something from, I feel like that's like, that's what everyone should kind of attest to, to create. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does sound like there's very much a sort of self-funding period where you invest all in uh, with what you want to be and then just kind of mm -hmm. hope that as you continue to go the direction that you'd like to be, that hopefully someone, a brand or different opportunities will arise that end up supporting it. But it's, it's you that you have to make that move first. first. Yeah, you have to jump first. And um, I think it's also like that you also have to find a balance of it because if, if you do find some success and then you just go down the brand route, you're like, oh, cool, like somebody's gonna pay me to go and do this. Like I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this. And eventually that kind of separates you from what you actually wanted to create. Um, and you might find yourself like in a couple years, like making money, doing something that's kind of relevant to what you wanted to do, but also kind of push in a different direction. So I think that once that starts to happen, it's important to still keep kind of the self-funded element alive to do exactly what you want to be doing with no expectations, with no external like edits or anyone else um, with their hands in it and just like create what you want to create. Um, so I think that's like important regardless of where you are at in your career. Absolutely. Is there anything that you say that you had to give up in the process, especially once you, you know, that particular calendar year where you saw that you had a lot of, um, you had a lot of things booked and you wanted to take advantage of that time. Uh, you said in the UK? Yeah, so it was, um, I had a job in the UK and I was flying through Iceland to get there. Um, so I did the my stopover thing. And that was like, I don't know, that's, it's been incredible as like a marketing case study how Iceland Air has like saved Iceland um, as a place because they were one of the first, like one of the first pillars to collapse when the economy um, really started to shift in like 2007, 2008. Um, and a lot of like 
it was a really bad place to be there for a little while, um, a really uncertain place. And then Iceland Air is like, they came out, it seems overnight, but all like it's a multi-year overnight success story. They're like, I don't know if you want to fly to somewhere in Europe from North America, um, just like come hang out for a couple of days and we'll just put like a, a gap in your ticket. And also they were the cheapest way to get to Europe for a long time as well. Um, so it was like, it was really interesting. Yeah. It's um, yeah. So I like, I, I love them. They have a good brand, a good company and um, a good country that they've like weirdly had a huge involvement in and that place also blows my mind because I live in a city that has, I think we have like 350,000 people in it. And Iceland as a country has like 330,000 residents. And the fact that like they can have so much infrastructure uh, and like have an airline with like multiple airplane, like probably a hundred airplanes now. And then my city, like we have like three Starbucks um, and like two bands that I listen to. And then Iceland has like five bands that I listen to and I don't know. It's just like they really bat above like their their weight class, I think, in every way. And it's like it's an incredible place to visit because of that. Um, also, like obviously as photographers, like it's an amazingly beautiful country. Um, and yeah, I've completely lost sight of the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> this, is, this, is sounding, this is sounding very familiar. Um, so I'm headed to Iceland myself for the first time. Nice. Uh, Baltimore. So wow, airlines, the other yep. fun airline, but uh, probably not nearly as pivotal in Iceland, but uh, so yeah, Wild Wild Airlines still there, and then um, on to Manchester. Yeah, it's nice. cheaper to do those trips, and hey, what a what a great place to stop over. Yeah, right? it's amazing. I love it there. I was there a couple weeks ago, and it's like <clears throat> it's so funny that you can just drive from like I'm sure you're aware, like just from like landscape to landscape, that every like half hour you go, you're in a completely different environment, and then beyond that, like this time of year, you also get all different types of weather. So you can just be like shooting this like beautiful mountain scene in the snow and then drive like 20 minutes and it's just like, oh, everything's just green again. Um, and it's like the cool, it's like the most dynamic. And I feel like there's also, um, I think with Iceland and why I keep going back personally is because it's like, it's almost like gambling whenever you're there because the weather is just so random. And I've been there, I'm gonna say like a collective 30, maybe 40 days. And I've never seen the Northern Lights. And it was like, that was enough to bring me back like one more time. It's like, ah, it's like, it's October. Should I go back? Yeah, like there, if there's a chance of like doing this, I'm gonna stop over on the way. Cause it, again, like it doesn't really cost that much to do that. And thankfully this time, fortunate, fortunate enough to see Northern Lights, so yeah. Oh man, have yet to. Uh, maybe I'll get a little bit of a show. Yeah, uh, so where, so you said you're near Canada. So where, where's your current base? Um, I'm based like an hour west of Toronto. Um, and I'm here, I don't foresee myself moving. I don't know. I, li I like the, the city that I'm in. I like the, um, I guess like the flow of everything. And also that we're, that we have this weird, um, it's completely unrelated to photography, but we have like a pretty crazy startup scene, um, in our local area. And we're starting to get like really known for it around the world. So the commercial opportunities that come from that are pretty significant. And I also love the idea of just like, knowing about products, like I'm sure you know as an F-stoppers uh, person, but just like knowing about products way before they exist. Um, I, I really, really enjoy um, having visibility on that. And um, I don't know if it mentally helps plan my life, but I feel like it just like, it just, it's like exciting when you get that like NDA job and you're like, oh, I can't talk about this, but this is awesome. Um, and I get really excited about that type of stuff. So um, fortunately in Waterloo, we have uh, a lot of that going on, so. Um, oh, yeah. When you saw those travel opportunities uh, with the weddings, was there anything that you can recall in particular that I had to kind of say, all right, I'm going to have to give up this, uh, you know, looking for the prize, so to speak? Yeah, I think it was all of the, I guess it's maybe a positive thing. So I pretty much just gave up all the work that I didn't really want to be doing anymore. Um, and it's like, it's so hard mentally to give up, like if somebody wants to pay you to come out to do an event or, um, or to photograph a kitchen or like real estate or something. It's so hard to just pass up that money and be like, no, like I, I, I'm busy. Here's, here's somebody else that I trust. Um, so I think it was like kind of just getting rid of that entire random photography job aspect of my life that for forever, that's kind of how I, that was like at least enough to keep me paying my rent. And at some point you just have to be like, I need time to focus on actually building my wedding photography company. Um, and then it was also that I noticed, um, so I had a part-time job kind of throughout that stage of my life as well. And I started to realize that while I loved what I do, 
that at some point it was it was costing me more money to go into work than it was to actually um, stay at home and work on my own business. So um, funny story there. I, I outsourced. So I was doing non like critical, like mission critical work for that, that company. Um, they were doing cool stuff, but um, I outsourced my entire job and just worked on my own business while I was actually at the office there because um, they were paying me well and I could outsource my job for like $11 an hour to somebody else that I trusted. Um, so it was very funny. And also I feel like that's why I'm, I just make a terrible employee. <laughs> And how was that carbonara? Was it any good? Oh, that was good. Yeah, that was, um, I would say that's like one of the best pastas I've ever had in my life. So if you're in Venice, I forgot what the place is actually called, but it's like pasta to go. And it's um, like everything on the menu is like, oh, I want to try everything. But then you get the portion and it's like pretty substantial. So you can't realistically eat it all. But um, yeah, and I was like, I guess there's one in Toronto too. I don't know if it's just the same name, but same name, same concept maybe, but I'm I'm going to check it out next time I'm around. <laughs> I would say the number one thing, um, if, if you know, if you're fortunate enough to know what you want to do in photography, um, start building that portfolio right now um, by whatever means necessary. Uh, that means like spending your own money to build your portfolio in the beginning, because if you, if you build what you want to be shooting early on, um, that's just going to compound over time because you're going to be doing the same thing that you want to do, but the job opportunities are going to get even cooler. Um, I think that's the most important um, thing that I would say as far as photography goes. Um, second, as far as business and marketing goes, just like if you're from a photographer first mindset, it's, um, it's really challenging to learn the business end of things. I think that I was fortunate enough that I'd, I'd always been the kid that like ran like the side businesses when he was like in grade seven and eight. Um, so from the business end of things, I, I felt very strong from the beginning. And I really do feel like at some point, um, I don't know if it was a conscious transition, but I knew that, that I wanted to run a business that I wanted, um, I don't want to call myself an entrepreneur, but um, that I wanted to do my own thing that I knew that I would make a terrible employee. Uh, so I just started just kind of like figuring out like, well, so what, what can like supplement that the fact that I want to run a business and I want to travel the world and I want to have essentially unlimited life freedom because that's the thing that I'm the most after is um, having the most like time freedom. So whether that's like if I'm shooting a, a wedding every Saturday because I shoot like 70 weddings a year, um, if I'm like if every Saturday and a lot of Fridays I'm at a wedding, what can I do to just like maximize my upside from that Sunday to the Thursday? So if I can have Sunday to Thursday to do whatever I want to be doing, um, that sounds pretty damn good to me. Um, so I really did just kind of model, I guess, my business after what lifestyle I kind of wanted to have um, in the end game. And I think that, that maybe that's a universal thing that everybody wants time freedom. Um, but photography is like a great way that you're able to do that, especially um, if, you, if you start and you put a lot of time in. Um, I would say number three is just the sheer amount of hours um, that you're putting in that the more the more at bats you have that if you if you're creating like video content or you're creating like a photo series the more stuff that you can just make and get out there in the world i think the better um i know there's probably people that would speak to the contrary of that to like keep things like collected and specific but i think the more stuff that you can just be creating the more chance that you have to get discovered or to discover what you want to do which is equally as important um so just like spending the time whatever in the photography realm that you're not the most comfortable with, just like focus on that um, to make to make that weakness a strength um, and try to stay focused. I know that um, I'm maybe the worst person to give advice because I'm like, oh, like I'm gonna start a band, I'm gonna record a CD, like now I'm gonna I'm gonna be a writer, I'm gonna paint some things, and now I'm gonna travel and now I'm gonna do weddings. Um, but I'm really consciously trying this year to not do all the other stuff that I want to do, or if I'm if I'm doing it, just like cultivate it to a point that it's professional and on caliber with my photography before I tell the world about it. Um, and then maybe to add one fourth thing as like a business marketing thing, I think it's really important for everybody to think about their own personal brand. And if you're a photographer, you have the ability to create all of your own media. Um, so if you can make yourself a media personality, that is gonna go a long ways um, just with like flexibility to do whatever you want. Like we have a food show that we do in Waterloo and like the reason for that was just to get me more comfortable in front of the camera in a place that I'm not usually in. Um, cause I'm comfortable in photography. I'm comfortable, um, talking about those things, but it's like, I don't know, let's see, like, let's do a food show. Let's see how, 
um, how that comes out. So I think it's important to keep trying things like that and to get actually in front of the camera. Um, and I was, I'm going to say probably the worst person in front of the camera. Um, when I first got started, like I couldn't put together a sentence, like even something like this would be like pretty impossible for me that I would have been like, oh no, I can't do like a live interview request. And I would have like tried to answer the questions and there would have been like 50 or 60 jump cuts in every answer. Um, but the more you do it, the more you just get comfortable with it. And, um, I think another thing, maybe this is the fifth thing, sorry to keep giving you, uh, giving you numbers. The, um, it's kind of said that like you are the person, the five people that you spend your most time around that you, you become that person, you emulate characteristics. Um, I think that also goes for people that you follow online and people that you consume their content. So if, if every week you're consuming a specific person's content, um, I feel like they become one of those five people that kind of influence you the most. Um, especially as somebody that like, I have friends, but I don't have, um, like I'm not, I don't see everyone every day. Um, but if I'm able to watch a video of like a daily YouTube creator or, um, a daily podcast or something like that, I feel like they have more of an influence on my life than some of the people that I actually know. Um, so pick those people carefully and just like follow that, their content and consume as much as you can if, uh, if it's somewhere that you want to go. Definitely. Hey, so if you had no restraints, you could totally just make it the decision right now, snap your fingers, what would you most want to be known for? Um, that's a hard question. I think that changes like every week. I don't, I don't know if I want to specifically be known for anything. Um, what I do, what I am passionate about is just creating a life that I actually enjoy. Um, and maybe this week that means that I'm going to focus like really hard on wedding photography. And then maybe three months from now, that means that a travel opportunity has come up and that, um, a brand is like partnered with me to go and do something. And that takes three months of my life. Um, I think the randomness of it, I think that, uh, by, by working long enough, I know that I have, um, a reliable income, um, at something that I'm good at, which is wedding photography. Um, and that I'm able to kind of use that level of, of comfort and, uh, just like really amp up the level of randomness, um, to go out and create other things that I think that I would like to create and find out. Um, but I think that, yeah, just by like exploring and figuring out more things that I want to do in life, uh, visit more places. I think traveling is important because it gives you, especially as somebody, if you're creating content, um, for the world, like you have to kind of see the world and know at least some of the people out there in order to really, um, I don't know, create like a great product or create a great video that speaks to a lot of people. Um, cause if you're just creating content from, from your bedroom, it's, um, it's hard to get kind of that, that full world approach to it that will really take your career to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for hopping on and, um, all right. That's all for today. Uh, thanks for listening to the podcast. I will be back tomorrow. If you have any questions for the podcast, I am going to start implementing them and doing episodes based around the content that you would like to see the most. Uh, so feel free to hop over to Patreon and in Patreon uh, at the very top, there's a link that'll take you to the public post where you can add any questions that you want. That is patreon.com slash Taylor Jackson. Uh, you don't have to be signed up. You don't have to be a Patreon member to do that. And I will do my best to get to as many questions as possible over the next couple of weeks. Thanks again for being here. I'll see you tomorrow.